Being a ginger, I don't normally come out in the daylight. Um, so we thought we'd just show you um, how to make a spoon. We won't complete it because obviously it will take a little bit longer, but just show you some of the cuts and some of the techniques and some of the grasps that we would use so that you can end up making a spoon uh, and still be able to count to 10. That's the idea, that's the plan anyway. So this is some cherry. Suitable timbers for, for carving, for, 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 for certainly making spoons and things like that that you're going to be eating from. I would say cherry is great, silver birch, sycamore, anything that's a reasonably dense uh, hardwood that's not too what we call, we call it ring porous. So things like ash and oak that have got very coarse open grain that almost look a little bit like uh, stalks of celery. They have a tendency to sort of uh, absorb what you're cooking with. So you'll find that if you make a coarse oak or ash spoon and you make a curry with it, it'll go yellow and it'll probably stay yellow for the rest of its life. So dense woods like cherry are perfect and they also smell so nice when you're working with them. I'll get you to sniff some of these shavings when we start cutting it up and it smells just like marzipan. It's just, it's just wonderful stuff. So this has been split from a much bigger diameter log. We always try and split it purely because we want to try and allow the wood to dry out without cracking. So we try and use wet wood because it's nice and easy to carve, but if you leave it in the round, it will always have a tendency to, to check, to split. So we've split it. This is actually a quarter. Um, and I think this will be perfect for a little, a little spoon and it will show us enough, enough parts of it so that we can see all the, all the cuts. These pool saws are phenomenal aggressive cutters. You've just got to make sure that it only cuts the wood and not your fingers. So make sure that you keep your fingers well tucked out of the way. And they only cut on the pull stroke. So concentrate on only pulling. And if you push too aggressively, you'll find that you'll buckle the blade. Worst case scenario, you'll break the blade. Worst case scenario is you'll cut your fingers as well. So they leave a really nice clean cut. So we've got rid of any checks. This bit is probably the bit I'd reject because it's got these knots. But this bit that fell on the floor looks like it's going to be a good bit. So we've got a nice fresh end that we'll probably have as our bowl of our spoon. This end that's just dried out in a few hours since it's been cut, <coughs> it's got a few checks in it. So you can either saw it off now or we can trim it off later. So we've split out our blank. We know that it's not going to crack on us now. We now need to think about where that spoon's going to sort of come from. So I'm going to try and make it a little bit artistic. And because on cherry you've got this lovely heartwood and sapwood, this two-tone effect, if we carve the bowl into this side, you'll get this lovely sort of shape of concentric rings sort of appearing, so it'll look really decorative. So in order to make a spoon out of that, I'm going to remove some of the material from the back side, and I'm going to start to cut a bit of a crank into it so it makes it a little bit more useful. So we use our little hatchet. Now when you're using an axe for carving, an axe that you'd be felling trees with or maybe splitting firewood with is probably quite different to what you'd carve with. This has got a relatively short handle. If I was using a big felling axe, I'd find that it would be too heavy and it would also catch on my clothing. So a, a nice hatchet that's got a stumpy handle is going to be a lot, lot safer. And we're going to hold the piece of wood at an angle and then we're going to strike down into the block. If we do it the opposite way, hold the piece of wood straight and strike sideways with the axe, it tends to move the piece of wood. You lose a lot of energy and it's not very efficient. So strike down, you'll naturally get that, just for the fact that you're sort of arcing from your elbow or your shoulder, you'll naturally increase the accuracy of your axe so you can get a bit more, a bit more professional straight away without even thinking about it. So tilt that over and I'm gonna put a series of nicks into the wood and I never go higher than where my fingers are. I normally stop at about two thirds of the way up the blank and then strike down. It's far easier to chop halfway up and then turn the piece of wood round than go off to A and E and get them to stitch your fingers back on. So it's dead simple and you'll just be constantly turning your piece of wood around. So we're gonna take a bit of that inner face off the bit of cherry
and then we'll just check it out. So we've got that almost like our sort of straight piece of woodlock we'd buy from the lumber yard. The next thing I tend to do is place where my bowl's gonna go. So what I actually do is, I use an ax, but we could cut in there with the saw. And I'm just gonna put a little notch into my blank, into my black blank of wood, and this is gonna create the middle of my spoon bowl. So what I do now, when I've severed the fibers, is I can work back towards that nick and then I'm going to actually use the piece of wood on the side of the chopping block and I'm going to use the very front part of my axe keeping my hands and wrist well away from where I'm chopping I'm just going to chop straight down in and almost straight away with those two cuts you can start to see that we've created that oval of what looks like a spoon and we're starting to get this sort of offset so you can start to see that it almost looks like a spoon that you'd get in your, your pot of hagen dazs at the cinema. So uh, yeah, we're getting that crank that we want. We go a little bit deeper. So increase that crank a little bit. And the secret with woodworking is to take your time, plenty of cups of tea, and make a few nicks and then assess. It's far easier to take your time than trying to stick these bits of wood back on. So I'm quite happy with that first initial crank. I'm then going to create the nose of my spoon. So I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to take a bit off this front end. So that's create the front of our spoon. And then I'm going to create the crank in the back side of the spoon. So I'm going to start to trim some more material off this back edge. keep your fingers tucked in you know if you leave your fingers hanging out you're more likely to catch them with the axe so keep them tucked well in and I can start to think about removing some of the sides now so I want to bring these these inner edges in now I have got on my chopping block if I spin it round a little notch and that really is quite useful because what I can do now is I can hold my spoon in that notch and I'm gonna strike down with my ax. And the sort of safety is the fact that the heel of the ax will actually make contact with the chopping block. So it'll prevent it going too deep. So I'll just rest it on there. You have gotta be a bit careful of this hand. And then we do put a few nicks in. And then we can start working back to that little slot. And once I get the ax in, I almost just lever and allow those fibers to do the work for me. little bite and again you could do this with a saw if you wanted to it's just I prefer to go progressively with the axe I find it a bit more comfortable plus I've done a few cuts sometimes and they've gone a little bit too deep with this it's sort of progressive take a bit off that side as well now it's no rules with spoon carving that's the, the other thing that I like about woodwork people say oh it doesn't you know there's a particular way of doing it I like the fact that they evolve the wood almost tells you what it wants to be you know if, it doesn't really matter if it doesn't quite fit your mouth you know it doesn't quite pick up your porridge as long as you've had fun doing it that's, the, that's almost the main objective making shavings is the key not necessarily making the product So slowly starting to work down those sides. And you've got to be careful. If we're working back down in this direction, if we go too deep and we haven't cut in deep enough in this direction, it's, it's going to turn into a, a chopstick before a spoon. So go nice and steady. And you can start to remove a little bit more of that thickness now, a little bit easier. And hopefully we'll start to see this crank starting to happen. So we can start to see we've got the front end of the spoon. And we're starting to get this sort of cranked handle. We'll take the bark off as well because the bark can be quite thick on cherry. And we'll start to round over that front a little bit. So I'm going to just start trimming the bits off that don't look like a spoon quite frustrating when I had a friend who was really exceptional at carving and I'd say to him how on earth do you carve that thing that looks like a fox's head and he'd say oh, it's easy just 
take all the bits that don't look like a fox away. And <laughs> it's always really annoying when you see somebody carving or doing something like that and they say something stupid, which doesn't really help at all. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just a question of knowing the process and being bold where you need to be and careful where you need to be as well. But never try and rush it. It's nothing about speed with spoon carving. I've had spoons that have lasted two or three days and you've just been whittling away at them a little bit at a time. So there you go, it's starting to come together. I'll take a bit more off that, that corner now. I think there's a guy here carving these exceptional spoons down the bottom, yeah, I think it's it Giles Newman, is it? Um, and he was saying to somebody that if he actually added up all the hours on his spoon, he'd be earning about two pound an hour. So, I don't think there's any, any craftspeople that actually do it for the money. And they do it for the uh, sort of cho life choice. So you can see how I start to do it, just a little bit here and a little bit there until I'm getting happy with how it's looking. And the axe can be quite a bold tool. It can remove big heavy chunks, but it also can be quite a refined tool. As long as you hold it close to the head, I'm hardly moving from the elbow, it's almost all in the wrist. I'm starting to chop down at a 45 degree angle here and we're creating what we call the keel of the spoon it's very sort of boat like it's got this lovely triangular section to it and it means that we can take it quite narrow because it's quite deep that's the sort of the plan so yeah it's gone from a log to something that's looking a bit more it's looking a bit more like a spoon really which is good well it's not if we're making a fork I suppose but we could oh, I've, I've turned many into a fork, yeah, that have gone wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so it's entirely up to you how much you do with the axe. What I normally say to people is if you're at the stage where you're doing this with an axe, you know, trying to pare down with it, you may as well stop and use a knife. It's probably more comfortable and actually more, more safe. Um, but if you're still taking relatively big chunks off with the axe, they carry on really. I'd probably take a little bit more time and I'd probably spend a little bit more effort refining these edges, but you get the gist, okay? So at that stage, safety-wise with an axe, if you're just stopping for a few minutes to redraw a shape, bury your axe in the block, it's totally safe. Avoid sticking it in like that because you'll forget about it, you'll walk past and you'll, you'll catch yourself. But if you've finished with the tool, I normally say stick the mask on it, you know, it's totally safe. I normally either stick it under my block if I'm working in the workshop, if I'm out in the woods, I'll stick it next to a prominent tree so I don't lose it. Um, but yeah, in this environment, we'll stick, it, we'll stick it under there. And normally at this stage, you can actually take the weight off your brain and you can sit down for a bit. So you can start to think, well, how much of this am I actually gonna start removing? So. I'll probably get a bigger knife at this stage and start to use some fairly powerful cuts to remove the bulk of the material. One of the most common grips is what we call the forehand grip, so we're holding it in a normal stance, cutting edge facing away from ourselves, and we're going to start working away from ourselves. Big mistake people make when they're sat around the sort of campfire whittling is they tend to sit like this, they get carried away with a lot of the whittling and, and then they end up cutting themselves. So I always say to people, just sit side saddle. It's sort of more comfortable, you get a longer stroke with your hand as well. And you want to try and avoid using just your wrist and your elbow for the forehand grip. It does work, but you'll find that you'll get fatigued. Oh, here you go, you've got an expert watching me. Oh, here, blimey spoons. You should have said, oh, I don't know about I didn't, me. I didn't want to. <laughs> so, you want to try and avoid using your elbow. I've got chronic tennis elbow anyway at the best of times. So, what I try and do is lock that arm. And I'm going to try and lift from my shoulder and I'm going to try and drop the whole of my arm and that's going to create a very long but very efficient stroke. Now you can increase the efficiency of that by angling the knife almost 45 degrees or beyond and you'll find that it will work like a guillotine. You'll get those lovely long curly shavings coming off 
and you're using this big shoulder muscle and you'll find that you could do that almost all day every day and it won't hurt you so I find that's great for sort of the rough work but the older I get the closer I need to see what I'm doing especially if I'm working in fine detail so the forehand grips great but my preferred grip for stop removal is what we call the scissor grip or the chest lever grip so what we do is we allow the blade to swivel round so we've actually got the cutting edge facing back towards ourselves and then we lift both the knife and the spoon up in front of ourselves so one it's closer so we can see what we're doing if you're doing it right you should be able to see the nails of your two thumbs and you want to lift it up, get your arms close underneath your pectoral muscles and you're going to engage the blade, hold your arms and your elbows close to your body and you're going to try and push your two shoulder blades so that you're, you're almost trying to squeeze a tennis ball between your shoulder blades. It, I like to call it the chicken grip. <laughs> okay, so imagine that you're trying to do a chicken impression and you're going to use this very controlled, very powerful grip that's using your big shoulder muscles and your pectorials the reason why I like this more than anything, if you're whittling and you sat around the campfire and you're talking to your mate, you know that he's not going to get an eye full of knife. It basically doesn't travel from beyond your body profile. So it's really nice, really nice and safe and controlled and you can see what you're doing. I sometimes get into that habit, you probably saw me there, of actually pulling backwards with this hand. It's not the best technique, but I find that it sort of lengthens the, my sort of grasp, I suppose, and stroke length. But for getting through that end grain, it works pretty, pretty good, really. And you can get these long, powerful strokes. <laughs> the other grip that I tend to like using for sort of profiling and getting long, continuous strokes is what I call the fulcrum grip, which Again, we can almost keep the knife in that same grip. So the cutting edge coming back towards ourselves. And what we do is we put the finger slightly in front of the handle. Now that distance isn't going to close because otherwise you'll cut yourself. We're going to keep that as a set distance. And we're just going to rock our sort of knife and hand on this fulcrum point. And we're going to let it travel up. And the safety is the fact that that finger hits the underside of that bit of wood. And the reason why I like that is because I can get these continuous cuts and I can follow a line and I can get very, very controlled finishes with a real nice degree of safety. It goes wrong if you allow that distance to close up, so you've got to almost lock that solid. And I find that that's a real, a real nice one, especially for getting nice long cuts. You get these sort of wings appearing on your, on your spoon. The other really good grip, some people call it the pistol grip, I tend to call it the thumb, the thumb grip because you're basically going to use the thumb of your left hand or your non-dominant hand to apply pressure on the back of your knife edge so that you can actually start to sweep the knife round and clean up these transition periods between the back of the bowl and into the stem of the spoon as well. And it's really controlled and the safety is the fact that the knife only travels as far as you can push with your thumb. You can sort of increase the efficiency by actually pushing with your thumb and actually rocking this backhand so you're slicing as well as pushing. And that's great for getting those sweeping cuts on the keel. I was saying earlier to people that cherry, even though it's nice to work when it's green, it's actually pretty dense. You can hear how the tool's really having to work cutting that end grain. And there is softer woods to work with, like a lot of people start carving with using things like willow, but you'll find that it's softer, but it's a bit fluffy and it's almost difficult to get a good finish. So starting with something like cherry or sycamore or birch that's possibly a little bit, a little bit denser, a little bit harder, you'll get an overall better finish. So we can use another grip. Everybody always gets taught never to cut towards themselves. We're actually going to cut towards ourselves now. So you were saying, was it you saying? I think it might have been uh, um, uh, Wayne saying that he gets a bruised sternum because he gets so carried away with what he's doing. And that's basically what you're going to do. You're going to push, push the spoon against your sternum, support the end with your fingers, and we're going to cut towards ourselves, but we make sure we point the tip of the knife away from ourselves, keep your arms close into your body again, 
and you're basically going to be safe because as soon as the knife and your arm hit your body, the knife can't travel any further. It gets dangerous as soon as it comes away from your body. You can follow through and you can cut your best cut to meeting t-shirt then as well. So keep your arms close to your body and you'll find that you can refine that shape. A nice, safe action. But yeah, you might get a slightly bruised sternum after a few spoons. So, yeah, sit, wit all refined. Have a cup of tea take a bit more off there's no deadline to making a spoon that's the great thing about it now end grain cuts like I was doing then there's a tendency that people always cut and they use their thumb as a, as a sort of end stop real real dodgy so if you are cutting end grain you want to make sure that you keep your thumb tucked well away and you're cutting into this void so there's no flesh to slice and I'll turn the spoon back and forth. And it's quite a good cut, especially for that dense end grain. Or you can use that thumb push cut again. I'll take a bit off this end as well. And you'll probably see as I'm working, I keep alternating between the cuts. But hopefully you'll see that I've always got some degree of safety. I'm not gonna be cutting willy-nilly I'm always thinking if the knife or the sp worst case scenario the wood breaks the spoon breaks what's the safety where am I gonna where's that knife gonna travel to so I'll make sure that I don't injure myself fortunately over the years I've not had too many disasters with a knife a few dodgy times I've managed to have a bit of a warning call and cut myself not too badly but I think everybody's going to cut themselves at least two or three times when they're learning to carve but if you've got a nice sharp knife they should be nice clean cuts and they should heal pretty quick but what I would say is if you are carving make sure you're not out in the middle of nowhere and nobody knows where you are make sure that somebody knows whereabouts you are or you've got a mobile phone and if you're carving always make sure that you've got at least a good first aid kit with a few Plasters and a few steri strips. And don't start carving after you've had 12 points of cider. It's never a good idea. So you can start to see it's starting to refine from that log that we started with earlier to something that's almost got that crank in it. It's starting to get there. So I'd spend a lot more time refining that shape. But rather than bore you to tears. I'll just show you a few other little tools that you would need to get that looking more like a spoon. So straight knives, great for the outside profile, but we need to make it so that it can hold our dinner. So we're going to use what we call a crook knife. And I normally suggest that people start with their dominant hand. So this is a little right-handed crook knife. And the secret with using a crook knife is you want to take little bites, little nibbles, it's easier if you work across the grain and I find that if you use what I call an open fist grip so you're going to hold it in your digits like this and you're going to have your fist almost open and then you're going to clench your fist and you're going to keep your thumb tucked well out of the way and it's going to create this arc it's going to create the shape we need and it's going to allow that blade to sweep up and away from our thumb don't start right on the outer edge of your spoon because you'll find that it will struggle start in the middle and just use that little open fist grip and start to lay little bites and as long as you continue that slice all the way through and up you won't have any difficulty the, the trouble when people start is they make a little cut like this and a little cut like that and you end up with this great big wall of fiber that you really strain against and suddenly it goes and then that's when you cut your thumb so take little nibbles and work progressively deeper and as you work progressively deeper you'll work closer and closer to the edges and you can start to see that lovely heartwood starting to appear as well so if you are going to work I sometimes rest it on my leg like this but I'm only using this open fist grip I'm not pulling like this if you've got it resting there and you're just pulling and it cuts through that wood you're going to do yourself some real mischief so only use your fingers now the advantage of this is it's only single beveled 
so I can actually get to the stage where I can turn it around and I can use the fingers of this hand to apply pressure and I can actually push with the tool. And the safety with that is the fact that I can only travel as far as that finger can push effectively. Now, I'm right-handed and there is a sort of technique where you can turn it over and you can use a right-handed one and push away from yourself. And it does work, but it's a little bit tricky. So for getting into that section, I actually prefer to use a left-handed tool, but I tend to use it in my right hand. And I'll push on that back edge with my thumb. And it allows me to work on that back end of the spoon, work that difficult end rein, and get a real nice smooth transition. And then swap back to a right. And what I could do now is I could swap over a Blue Peter styley and I could finish off this one, which <laughs> when you've roughed out a spoon and it's green, you'll sometimes find that it's, it might be a bit difficult to get a really, really smooth finish. We started this spoochula uh, this morning. We made most of it on the shave horse and we roughed it out and it was a little bit fluffy. So if I go over it now it's probably at about four or five hours of drying and in this heat you'll be surprised how quickly it will dry out and it sounds totally different as well if we go over that we can get a really nice smooth finish it almost sounds like you're sort of carving balsa wood now really so nice smooth cuts and plus being a metal worker I tend to make it a bit dirty when it's green, so if I go over it when it's dry, you can get this real nice crisp finish, take off all those dirty finger marks, and make a much better job of it. Well, that's quite incredible how that's drawn out in that short period of time. So there you go, you get the idea. And it's quite nice when you've finished a spoon. You can see where my dirty hands are marked it up. It's quite nice when you've finished it and you're happy with the overall shape of it to actually spend a little bit of time putting a little bit of decoration on it. It's quite nice normally to carve some sort of little pattern or little finial on the end of the spoon. Most spoons these days I don't actually sell. I end up either giving them away or... <coughs> mostly give them away really or keep them or give them to Lois I must admit I've turned into Vinnie Sunsfist really because all the spoons he makes he basically puts his his wife's name on the back and he never ever sells them so all the spoons I tend to really like I'll end up carving some funny little heart and giving it to Lois or something so it's quite nice for me. yeah sweet eh <laughs> but it's really quite nice going over it when it's dry you can get some real nice shiny little facets on it and I'll even put my little mark in it. This is a bit big, I'd probably use a much smaller knife. And I wouldn't necessarily rest it on my knee, I would normally rest it on a chopping block or something. And you can use the tip of your knife to just mark and cut in. We do two little 45 degree cuts. And we can start to mark in my initial. And what I would say to all the expecting parents out there never give your children a name with a curved letter because it is a real pain <laughs> carve into wood give them something like nick or natalie or something like that or k's are good as well kevin or catherine these are a real pain to carve into wood <laughs> so i normally put a little b in the backs of my spoons I did get lazy at one stage and buy a little branding iron and I started branding stuff but it never quite looked as good as, as the caster. I'll just finish this off quickly. I'd probably go over it. There is a technique where you just go straight in with a knife and then you rub in pigment. Traditionally it would be made from like scorched roots of an alder which would give you this sort of ochre colour and it would show up and make it really pronounced on the wood like scrimshaw but I normally just use a bit of oil and dirt from my finger and that seems to make a difference but those are a few tools, few safe 
safe cuts. So hopefully it'll give you the confidence to just give it a try. Um, any questions on that? You're all happy? That's really good. So yeah, I'd, I'd just suggest uh, finding a nice spot, either in your garden or in the woods. Set up a nice little chopping block, make some shavings, feel the stress of the week disappear, mm. and uh, you'd be good to go, really. Don't worry if you don't end up with a spoon. If you end up with them, it's even better, you know? So don't worry about uh, the end result. It's about the, it's about the journey, really. Okay. Thanks a lot. Cheers, Cheers.